The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the third lecture covering the first movement of Debussy's La Mer. At the end of the previous lecture, we saw a lot of the themes explore each other in this beautiful riot of tone painting. We're just about halfway through the movement. So what does Debussy do? He doesn't compose a sonata allegro, revisiting the exposition on the dominant or anything like that and working his way back. Instead, he introduces a completely new theme and a new feeling into the work, which is another reason why I feel that this, even though it is a symphony, is also in the form of a sketch, right? So that completely liberates Debussy from being tied down to traditional common practice form. And how does he do it? In just the most memorable way. He's got 16 cellos, divisi, starting off with four pairs, so eight cellos to begin with. And here's the new theme. Ba -dum -ba -dum. Notice the change of key signature to two flats. And as the cellos hold that pitch, the timpani come in with a sforzando pianissimo, boom, brum, roll, up to piano and back. Same thing with the horns, doubling the harmony in the cellos. Then there's this little flare here at the end, just a little push as the timpani subsides. Then the cellos come back in and they don't have any horns or timpani to support them, but this time the double basses are going to push a little bit, and that is going to help replace that missing grounding, which before we just saw as pizzicato for the double basses. Now, something that a lot of people miss when they do score reading is to really take note of when the composer indicates bowing marks. Sometimes it's just lack of experience, and then the composer goes on and assumes that they should put in all their own bowing marks, even though they don't know how to do that, which I hope my viewers will not be doing. But in this case, I think it's quite fascinating. This is something that the concertmaster might have bowed out for the cellos, or that the principal cellist might have bowed out for his section. So notice we have a push to the sforzando, and then back to piano, diminuendo. So this bowing makes complete sense. So dum, bum, and then subsiding. Up bows tend to gain energy as the bow goes from the tip to the frog, and then reverse. They have a lot of energy right at the beginning and then tend to die away. Now here, Debussy is doing the opposite, isn't he? He's starting strong, and then he wants an extra push into the fourth beat here. The double bass might also be marked with an up bow there, and then a down bow here. So that really shows the difference between these two. It is a difference of dynamic approach. Along with that, Debussy has also indicated that he wants the full cello complement to be playing, all 16 cellos, as opposed to just the eight previously. Now, not every orchestra has got 16 cellos. Oftentimes, even a nice professional standard orchestra will only have around maybe 12 or so. So they will just divide this up amongst a dozen cellos or whoever they've got. 
In the case of Kaleidoscope, I think they've only got eight cellos to begin with, so they just continue on with the same eight. But that really doesn't make any difference. Debussy just wants a stronger, more intense texture right in here, so he'll get that. Notice, along with our new key signature and our new motive, we're also getting a new time signature and some changes to the tempo. So very rhythmic, actually not all that fast, but still very lively. Now this continues on, and as it does, and reaches stronger pushes right in here, the horns come in right underneath it. And it is really hard for the horn players to control what they're doing. There will be a tendency, especially with an orchestra where the horn player has really got to take responsibility for the horn players to play out a little bit. Whichever player is coming in first is going to have to help guide the other players, in this case the fourth coming in right in here and then the first playing off of them. So it's a little ragged in the Kaleidoscope Orchestra recording. A little blaring right in here and just a little off right here in the middle of the bar, but I think that we can forgive those players because there are things in their interpretation which are so different and so unique to them as opposed to other recordings where there's a conductor, right? So it's give and take. It's not that, oh, wow, that orchestra can't play or whatever, or they were off in this one bar or other. That totally is not the philosophy you should be using when you analyze how these orchestras are performing this work. Rather, you should be noting difficulties, as you yourself may be working in an orchestra like that someday, or you may be a conductor, so you may be thinking about places where you can hear the music come apart just a teeny bit at the seams, and how would you cue the players so that they could come in a little bit more on time, or be a little bit more blended. I've heard this part right in here, where the horns push out a little bit, even with a conductor, and I've heard recordings where they're very, very subtle, and they just blend in with the cello tone. So it really just depends on the philosophy. Like I said a couple lectures ago, there really is no one way to play Debussy. It's not like Ravel, who is so obvious in what he exactly wants, and he will not let you stray from that one iota. Quite the contrary. Debussy has got a lot of flex in his music. On the next page, we see the cellos bringing their statement to an end here, and then there's a little reaction from the horns. I really love that. And then they settle right here on this new tonality, which could be a D minor 6-4 chord, as we've got F in the bass here, and a D minor octave chord in the horns, but kind of seems to suggest a B-flat major 7th chord. When you see which way the music is headed ultimately, it kind of feels like that. Like This is not really that melancholy color or that sadder color, but actually quite lovely. Here's a great example of trading off between two wind players, where each player is getting just a little fragment, and this actually takes some coordination. It's much easier on a player to just get an entire bar to themselves and then dovetail on the first note of the next bar with the other player taking the next one. But what's lovely about this is that the audience will hear just that slight variation between the timbre of the two players, which is almost unavoidable, even for great players. Some players sitting next to each other can just really nail each other's tone and style. Like the second, if the second is a fantastic player, they can imitate the first player almost as if they were doing an impression of them as a stand-up comedian. Not necessarily mocking, but you know what I mean. It's an attempt to completely take away any kind of variation, but I find that that is boring. I really like the way that, say, the players from the Kaleidoscope Orchestra handle this. You can really tell the difference between the two players, and yet they really play seamlessly here. Now don't be fooled by these rising lines here. At the end of each of these group of two beats, the clarinet will be rising up 
to this note right here, which is concert D. And that concert D is going to sit in the rhythm of the flutes right here, just before this ending D for this rhythmic phrase. And the same thing is true here. These rising B naturals, which is the same here, the English horn is also going to be playing a concert B natural. They are sitting just one sixteenth note before the flutes finish their little rhythmic phrase here. So it almost feels like it's sitting in there in a clumsy way, right? And that's just the way the musical fabric is. It has nothing to do with the way one orchestra plays it or another. You can kind of limit that a little bit by submerging some elements or others. And I've actually heard conductors try to get around that problem or the players kind of unconsciously trying to get out of each other's way rhythmically there, but it still does happen. And in the case with Kaleidoscope, where they are really playing off of each other and they're playing inside of each other, then it's going to come out more, but it's just in the music. It has nothing to do with the way that the musicians are necessarily interpreting the music. Now here, we're seeing more of that rising fifth, you know, bum, bum, bum. So here we've got more rising fifths. Same thing here, these rising fifths here. Let's go back to the way the music is constructed because I feel we're going to miss out on a few things. So this little D minor chord diminuendo underneath the new artless, as they would call it, really meaning innocent, new flute theme. As I said before, D minor sixth chord with the horns playing a D minor octave chord and then F below by our timpani and double basses. And then we've got a little F third here, divisi tremolos with the second violins. That's just really a lovely sound there. And I just really feel the inherent conflict there in minor six four chords, right? Especially with this kind of harmonically ambiguous music that that could just as well be a B flat major seventh chord with the root taken out, as I mentioned before. And then this is all beautiful, very simple impressionist scoring. With the strings in the back, here WC is limiting it to eight violin players, then 16 violinists. That would have been a really big orchestra, if you think about it, having 16 cellos just go up by twos. <laughs> It could possibly mean that there were 18 violas, 20 seconds, and then 22 to 24 firsts. So this would only be one third of the available string players. That would be a big orchestra. This is just background to what is going on here. Notice that the clarinets, after they've played their little development of the opening theme as accompaniment underneath a new theme of the flutes, they go into this back and forth role that was being played here in the seconds, of course, on different pitches. And then oboe and English horn in octaves. There are several examples in this work which are really great and show that the oboes and English horn can function as octave partners because of the placement and strength of their registers, rather than just thinking, well, they are a perfect fifth apart and their strengths and weaknesses should be exactly the same because they are all members of the same family. Well, that is not true at all. The English horn has a beautiful, warm, and controllable low register, whereas the oboe tends to get a little too strong and more difficult to control in its lowest register. Not to say that those notes are no good. I mean, look at Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. There is a beautiful low oboe solo in there, but it is definitely not the register where you can just squirm around very, very quickly and play all these little complicated technical passages on the bottom notes with the same kind of fluidity as, say, the English horn over that same written range. So when you put all that together, you can see that the English horn plays octaves beautifully and with very, very similar strengths of register. This little idea gets traded off, continuing on, 
to the first clarinet and uh, two bassoons. And that is going to continue on for a couple of bars. What's very cool here is that the first harp takes over on this little theme. If I were conducting this in a revisionist style, say like Eugene Ormandy or those other conductors of the middle <laughs> of the 20th century where they would just reorchestrate things, I would actually have the second harp play this along with the first harp. But I actually like the way that Kaleidoscope plays this. You can hear the harp very, very clearly. It's not really all that strong, but it does carry on the flute and keep the motion going until it really does become just a flurry of going back and forth between the flutes and the piccolo. As this is developing, getting stronger and stronger and more and more intense, we see other elements coming in. Bum bum! <laughs> With the horns, just taking the beginning of that new motive and being interpreted also by the also by the oboe family in terms of grace notes. Dun dun! You need to sort of catalog this in your musical memory because this little gesture here, it's not even a motive, it's really just a gesture, is going to become more and more important as this entire set of movements develops. It is going to return again and again until finally it is one of the fundamental thematic elements of the third movement. Now, everything is set up for a beautiful coalescing statement of the new melody started in the flutes by both sets of violins. What's really, really wonderful here is the sense of counterpoint. We're going right back to ba -dum bum <laughs> that we heard in the cellos. And that is playing alongside da 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 And it's so easy for the ear to just fixate on what is the most obvious thing playing and to ignore this beautiful counter melody here, even though both the violin melody and the counter melody in the winds and a little bit of viola, even though they share the same rhythm here, that doesn't mean that they are really fundamental parts of one another. Like this is just harmonizing what's going on in the strings, because really this has its own direction inside or under what's going on in the violins. I just feel that this is wonderful first-rate scoring and probably the kind of scoring that would have really interested Lily Boulanger. Not to get sidetracked, but just focus on the two main elements here working against each other. And even the bass line having a little bit of independent action in here. So think about all these things. We've talked about a ton of things so far. This is going to be a little bit shorter lecture than usual just because the ending of the piece is coming up and I don't want to make it too long, like one huge long lecture as opposed to two shorter lectures. I think it's just easier to absorb. Anyhow, but think about all of those things. The counterpoint that is carefully worked out in these last two bars and speaking of multiple independent voices, the way that this theme works its way through different groups of instruments, and there are counter melodies working against it, and there are accompanying back and forth kinds of harmonies going on. And I really love these notes that rise up a fourth and up a fifth and so on and so forth, doubling clarinets and then eventually picked up by the harps. And then, of course, this absolutely perfect entrance with cellos soli. There have been some questions in the group about avoiding doubled string instruments. And I think here you can see that in this harmonic context, doubled cellos sound fantastic. And in fact, it really is doubled violins in specific that are the problem in scoring small string ensembles. Doubled violas are not so bad. Doubled cellos are perfectly fine. And of course, two basses is often just the maximum of what you end up with 
in a small orchestra to begin with. So while it's not perfectly ideal just to have two cellos playing a major theme, it still works out great in this particular instance. Listen for the horns and maybe the difference between this right in here, this more prominent horn sound as opposed to some other recordings where it is more of a blending sound. And please be forgiving right in here. It is really hard to manage some of this stuff. Okay? And I will see you in a couple of screens. third screen, you can see that the reed instruments are kind of wrapping up the end of the full thematic statement of the cellos. And that is leading, with a little bit of help of this rip upwards, this ten tuplet in the cellos and firsts, to this restatement of the flute theme. Now, this is all kind of intricate, but in another way, it's pretty obviously put together. So we will take it apart in just a second. But before we do that, I just want to point out the power of what Debussy is doing here, using the violins and the cellos in octaves right here with the middle strings, the seconds and violas, interlocking with them. Notice that that continues on all the way throughout this page. And that is actually a bit of a romantic period convention, but it's nonetheless extremely effective because those are probably the two strongest and brightest groups of instruments within the string section. So teaming them up like this, and especially having them probably seated very close together or across from each other in the orchestra, makes for a very unified, powerful statement. And you'll hear that in the recording, especially when we get to this part right in here. What's wonderful about these four bars is the way that the theme is just tossed from one group of instruments to the other, very much just like waves tossing. It's like the whole ocean is trading off this theme, going back and forth. So you're starting here with da 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 dum and then this rip upwards to this high A, dun da dun, dun, right, which overlaps with da 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 dun, rip up, dun dun, and then C, bum 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 bum, rip up, bum 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 bum. You've got this really cool doubling as well, a two flutes plus a two clarinets trading off with those middle strings that we just talked about, seconds and violas. So that is a really, really great way of having a conversation right in there. And then we've got a little bit of a preview of some syncopation that is going to be more prominent right in here. Meanwhile, the double reeds are playing this slowly lifting harmony right in the middle of all the other action. And it has this lovely kind of growling, dark sound, very Russian. And it's not just a harmonic filler, but it is also introducing the sense of syncopation into the 12-8. So it's like having six pairs of eighth notes rather than four triplets in a row, right? So you've got your one, two, three, four, 
five, six happening here. And this becomes ever more pronounced as the trading off becomes even more intricate. Da dun da dun all right is being played there with even more punch right on that third beat and of course some support from below by horns and double basses coming in nice and solid on that third beat and then of course the emphasis on the fifth beat following that so yeah it's just a fun little syncopated idea in there but it does help keep the listener off balance it's not supposed to be obvious it is supposed to be throwing these little bits and pieces all over the place and this is something where I would feel it would take a lot of practice for a group that does not have a conductor and Kaleidoscope pulls this off really well especially as we add the flutes right up in here finally we have an explosion of excitement here and there are so many fun things in here the middle winds the oboe family plus the clarinets and the horns all playing that opening idea da -da -da, and so on it really develops that opening idea nicely and that's played against ba dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da da dun going throughout all of the upper strings and then of course this nicely reversed motion in the lower strings playing a backwards version of the same pitches at the beginning and then syncopated downwards to this C and so on and glittering over everything are the harps playing these lovely downward spilling figures and the piccolo on top and that adds together beautifully right in here the bassoons are basically just doubling the first two notes of each group right there in the lower strings but then holding on to the C and that's also very very effective so here by the third bar we lose the flutes helping out and everything is coming down a little bit diminuendo little by little and then we lose the oboes and we lose a couple of voices here right at the beginning of the bar in the horns and while the energy subsides the pitches of the strings remain so they are just diminuendoing little by little to piano right here right in the middle of that Debussy throws this nice little callback not really that same octave melody that we saw before stated over and over again in the horns but just enough to where we are reminded of it with just a little touch of flute right in there for fun and then the harps kind of take over with that a little bit we've got a little second horn and bassoons as the music in the strings slowly climbs upwards verging more and more towards a whole tone scale at that point I will have to stop the lecture because what happens next is pretty intricate to get into and it's intricate enough already actually maybe not quite as much as it could be it's not like a page of Schoenberg's five pieces for orchestra where everybody is doing something completely different in function and they yet they all tie together somehow in an atonal frame of reference which is hard enough to analyze just looking at the orchestration and not the individual function of each line with this it's easier to really see the way the instruments are working collectively because the ideas are very simple in some ways not that they are anything less than beautifully original and striking but there's a certain directness to them which is enchanting and effective and that is really at the base of Debussy's style too so I will leave you to listen to this and to think about all of those things listen for the glittering harps right in here they're easy to miss the 
piccolo tends to absorb a lot of glittering sounds into it. But yeah, especially around rehearsal mark 11 and before it, listen to the way that different ideas work against each other, whether it's syncopation or contrapuntal motion or just two ideas that are both worth playing at the same time, like ba dum bum and this beautiful rocking motion in the strings. Try to listen to things that aren't so obvious, like these big rips in the cellos and the first violins. Listen to how the instruments trade off these themes. And listen to the way the syncopation grows quite naturally out of necessary functions that are inside the thematic development as well. And I will see you next month with the very end of this movement which has got some beautiful surprises in it and an interesting speculation as to what Satie's greatest compliment was to his friend Debussy when he listened to this work for the first time.